Okay, today is February 25th, night 2013, and we are interviewing Frankie Fink at Gridley Public Library. And Mr. Frank Fink was born 2-13-1949. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be inter uh, interviewing Mr. Fink. Mr. Fink, could you state for the record what war and branch of service you served in? Yes, I was in the uh, Vietnam era, and I was in the Army. Okay, what was your rank? I was a specialist in uh, four. Okay. When you first were enlisted or joined the Army, were you drafted? Did you enlist? Uh, I was drafted. In fact, I... I'm the only one out of my class here in Gridley that was drafted. Uh, none of the others in my class ever went to service. Do you remember your draft number? Yes, 51. Where did you go when you first were in um, draft? Went into the service? Well, when I was first drafted into the service, of course, I had to go to Chicago and get your physical and everything. And then they said, "Well, you're you're going to the service." And so they set me a date, and I was uh, went to Fort Campbell, Kentucky, first to do my uh, basic training. And at that time, uh, the company, after completing their eight weeks of training, uh, everybody was assigned MOSs. <laughs> I was assigned a uh, infantry and there was only four people out of our company that were infantry and the rest of them were all assigned cooks or different MOS's that uh, didn't have much to do with uh, the actual combat and uh, from Fort Campbell Kentucky uh, the four of us uh, <laughs> got to go to that real nice place of Fort uh, uh, Louisiana down there Fort Polk and again, after our training of AIT training, again, there was only four people picked from our company that were going to go on to advanced jungle training. <laughs> and I was one of them again. And I knew what that was for. It was, uh, you were going, you were headed toward Vietnam. Well, at that time, I had a brother, Fred, that was already over in Vietnam. He'd done one tour in my folks wrote to Fred and told him that uh, I was taking advanced jungle training and I would be coming over there. Well, somehow, because one brother was over there, over there, he signed up for another tour. He says, "You're not coming over here." So, get myself back together here. <clears throat> so I went ahead and was in Panama and uh, instead of going to advanced jungle training they uh, come and told me that my MOS was being changed that my brother was <clears throat> staying in Nam. The different oh, governments that got picked up by his government and our soldiers and there is nothing that we could do for him you know it's a different government and it took I remember one of the soldiers there was telling me he was down there for over three years in their prisons he was just picked up on the street they didn't like you you think for you in jail and the same way with their people you know he used to go downtown and you were real careful what you did. But I used to watch uh, their policemen, their soldiers. It wasn't policemen, they were soldiers. If they didn't like somebody down there or one of their own people, they'd just beat the crap out of them right there on the streets. <laughs> you couldn't do that here. And this was in Balboa, mm -hmm. Panama? Yeah. So you were yeah. actually allowed to go off the base of Panama? Yes, yes, we were. We could go downtown. And I did. It, it was it was nice uh, they had one street that was really nice you know businesses but if you got off that street it was like uh, I hate to say that like the slums of Chicago 
the streets, the homes. There were a few homes that you were either rich or you were poor. There was no in between middle classes there. You either had it or you didn't have it. So and those people who didn't have it, it was rough. It was a rough life for those people. And I talked to them. And, and after you were there so long, I got to meet a few of them. In fact, one of our sergeants was married to a Panamedian, and he introduced me to his family, and I got to meet quite a few of them that way. Went out in the interior with him and talked to them. But they didn't have anything. There was stayed overnight one time with them. <laughs> they lived in a it was like a block house with no windows, no doors, no floor. It was just a dirt floor. And uh, we stayed that night with them. And we all went into one room. Everybody slept on the floor. Just laid a, a cover on the floor and everybody just it was like a row of us people just laying on the floor. Hot, dirty, no running water. And uh, they had some spigot for the maybe whatever homes were around that area. You go out to that one spigot, get your water. No, no bathrooms, you know. They don't care if they go out and somewhere in a hole and dig it and then cover it back up. And of course, then the animals and have something to come along and dig it up. It was, and oh, I tell you, there's a story. That, uh, doctors you know it's not like the United States here when I was out going out in the interior one time I was driving I had a little bought a little car when I was down there I was going out with a sergeant and they do have a road they call it the transatlantic highway it'll run from all in the United States all the way down through the little countries and all the way down to South America and uh, but it's really a rough road <laughs> But I, uh, when I was out in the interior one time, I watched this little, it was a little girl. She got hit with a bus, and they just walk on the sides of the roads. There's no doctors out there. So they just they hauled a little, took the girl along the side of the road, and they stand there and wait until she dies. Then they just take her off the side of the road and marry her. That's it. There's no help. You know, that, that's sad. Did the did the did the military doctors help? There wasn't any military out in the interior too much. Okay. You know, it's there's no phones out there. I don't know how they communicated. Hmm. It's just maybe it's a little <laughs> live maybe a little by the homage. I don't know. They just it was sad. You know, there's just no help out there for them people. They get sick. There's no help. It's you just. Either you get over or you die. What you said you were a clerk typist down there. What did you do? Did you process the soldiers coming in? Or? Yeah, paperwork, yes, and it was for all oh, daily operations that were going on. You'd make a memo or something, you had to type the memos up, make sure that all the companies knew what was going on and it was just little odds and ends. I did we did get the memo that uh, the time that uh, the Ted Offensive came up. Vietnam that was a big push and uh, that was we had a lot of paperwork then because all the companies were on alert in case you know something really big happened there was a lot of them going to be moved out to Vietnam pretty quick but never happened and did you was your work day more of a eight to five or eight? yeah yep so you had it evenings is. off yes what were the living conditions of your of your base? My they were they were pretty nice. I mean, for military people, um, we were in a big barracks, open room, and you had a little cot that was your bed, and you had a little locker, and the lockers were usually around the area that other guys there might be four in that little section. And I think if you were E five or above, you had a little room, but the rest of us, you know, were just out in the open, but. It was it was nice. I mean, I mean, and then you got you got food every day. The mess hall was just you just go downstairs and you had good breakfast, good dinners, good suppers, and they had things for you to do in the evenings when you were off. You go play pool, you know, whatever you wanted to do, read books. And they also had uh, university uh, extensions. If you wanted to go to college, you could go to college. 
Did take you courses. take advantage of that? Yes, I did. Did you? I took a couple of courses, yes. Uh -huh. Did they have entertainers come down there? <sighs> I've never seen any entertainers down there. Uh -huh. What was the weather like down there? <laughs> it was... Uh, no, it was humid most of the time, wet. They had monsoon seasons. I can remember when it would rain. <laughs> you couldn't even see the ground. Everything was just flooded. Just rotted, run in the barracks and stuff. But as soon as it quit raining, then the water just, because it was sandy soil, just, just run off. Of course, it's only a 50 mile stretch from you go from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> so yeah, that was nice. You know, we'd, Major that I drove for that was a driver. I drove for a major and He'd take me with his family a lot of times. He'd go out to the oceans Have a good time play ball and just Have a good time. So there were a lot of officers down there that brought their families down. Oh, yes you know, A lot of officers and I think if your rank depending on what your rank was I think E5 above they usually found some kind of housing Hopefully it was on base, but some of them lived off base, lived down in Panama. So, How far was Panama City from? Um, probably four miles, maybe, oh, from so my it base. Far. We had really, they were really nice bases down there, really, really kept up nice. But uh, like I said, when, when, of course, that was part of the, Whatever it was, you know, we had to get the canal zone back to the Panamanians. Mm -hmm. But we left everything. <laughs> that. What about the, the, in the canal zone, the... The locks. The lock. Did you ever participate in, in the lock area? No, well, guarding. Yeah, we mm -hmm. did that. But myself, I'd never done that because our company was assigned to uh, guard the motor pools. And the companies like A, B, C, and D companies were all assigned to guard the dams. And that was the locks because those big old doors and stuff and going out, those ships going through in case any sabotage. But the companies were all assigned to that. So they did that 24 hours a day. Back when you were down there, um, were the locks pretty open that you could wa walk and watch? Yeah, where we, if you were in the military and you had your pass, yeah, you could watch them. In fact, uh, probably from here to where Garvey, or not Garvey, it is, uh, the green elevator is, is where the lock was. You could watch it go through their canal, mm -hmm. through our barracks. But if you wanted to, you could just walk over and look at it. <laughs> It's amazing to watch that water just <laughs> comes in, raises that ship up, and then the next one will that lock will open up them big old doors, and that ship will go right down <laughs> next area, and he'll raise back up. It's really amazing. What um, did you get any leave time down there? E yes, if you wanted it. In fact, I got it. I was. Uh, they had a uh, competition down there, all companies that included the Air Force, Navy, Marines, and uh, they picked four people, and you had to go through this competition, a dress and your uniforms, and uh, how you presented yourself. And anyway, I got picked, and I got to come back to the United States on a TDY pay to Jamestown, North Dakota, representing, uh, which was Custer's. 4th and 20th mechanized unit. So we were out there for two weeks for a parade, which was really nice. That was all paid for, you know. <laughs> First time I ever had buffalo meat. <laughs> but yeah, that was nice. And then uh, when I got out of the, uh, the two weeks out there for parade, I came back to home for a week. And then I went back down to Panama. Back to serve the rest of my time. I still had a lot of time left when I got out of the service that I got paid for. But it was nice down there. There was a lot of things you could do. I enjoyed it down there. I, I really enjoyed the service. I mean, I can't say I didn't. I think any, I know, <laughs> I know when I went in, I, I know you're probably apostolic, but when I went in, <laughs> they didn't really, like, back in the 70s, they did not, you know, and 
They didn't want their kids in it, but it is really serious. It is a good experience, a good grow up period for kids, and it's not all it's not all combat. You don't have to go into a combat. If you want to enlist in the service, do your three years of time, you can get an education out of the military, paid for, and you can go into correspondence. You can go into whatever you want to do. They've got it. You don't have to go out there and fight. And it's a good experience. It's a good grow up, Mary, because you're not around mom and dad. Hey, you go pick up your clothes in the military. That's just that is your you will do that you've got to grow up so <clears throat> so the experience that you had in the military was a gr good grown up good grow up period mm -hmm. very good and you did take advantage of the court of the college oh, classes yes. that you op were offered that's offered to all of them mm -hmm. you, even when you enlist you can just because you take an MI, you can take all the college courses you want, and it's paid for. You don't pay a dime. Mm -hmm. And then when you get out, you can still go back to school because you've accumulated college credits and college time paid for. Did you use the GI Bill? Yes, I did. I graduated, and I taught school for a special ed teacher for two years. Of course, didn't pay much when I was teaching in the 70s, so I went to Caterpillar. How long were you in the service? Three years. And you served all that time down in Panama. Panama. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did you? How did you communicate with being down in Panama? I bet with the communications uh, not being very good. How was? How was it that you were able to communicate with your family? Oh, home? now the family. Now the phone. Now they had phones on the post on the base. Mm -hmm. You could call home. I, I. In fact, I'd call home. At least once every two weeks. Really? Yeah, and talk. And at that time, I was going with a girl back home, and I enjoyed talking to her. But that didn't work out too good. But anyway, I, I and my brother worked at a telephone company, and there's a lot of times he'd he'd just I'd call home, and he'd connect me with all my brothers. You know, there was some in Matt Hudson, and some in El Paso, and the rest of them. We'd all have a five or six way conversation going, so it was nice. So the communication was was, was okay, was yeah. available down yeah. there. But not I'm, it's for the military, yes. Right. But right. for the the Panamanians, no. They didn't have anything. How was the food? Food was good too. Mm -hmm. They had good food for military people. Really good food. I think the uh Navy had the best. <laughs> I don't know why, but they always had the better food. If I could slip over to their post, which I did a few times we'd go over to the other side and eat their food because they'd always have steak. We might have hamburger, but they'd have steak. <laughs> Did you have <clears throat> on your post, this, so there was all of the branches down there in Panama, <clears throat> and you all had your, your own post? Yeah. <clears throat> Did you have um, like a PX? Yes. And was it fully stocked mm -hmm. or was it just a small yep, one? No, it was fully stocked. It had... It had everything. In fact, before I got out of the service, <laughs> I bought all my clothes just so I'd have them because they were cheap. I bought all my you know, everything I wanted back there: shoes, my uniforms. You know, I even bought a few suits just to have when I got back here because it was it was really cheap. And I, and I think back there uh, when I got back home, I think gas was getting up into the 60s, 40s, 50s. But we down there, I was only paying 19, 12 cents for gasoline for my car. <laughs> it was a lot different. It's cheaper down there. And oh, I can remember, it was, I enjoyed one time I got to go on a, we used to talk about time off. Uh, I did teach a Sunday school class down there for the time I was down there. And they asked me at the time if I wanted to go on a religious retreat to Cali, Colombia. I said, oh, yeah, I'd like that, but it was for two weeks. So I went to Cali, Columbia, clear up in the mountains, and that was really nice, really nice. And was that with the Army? Yeah, <clears throat> military, yeah. And did you communicate with the um, natives? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I bought some stuff down <laughs> there, too. Cali bought some silver, because that was uh, in Cali, Columbia, I think, is one of the biggest silver mines 
you know, you, you the silver that you come back here with. I bought some silver down there. Had it shipped back here. It didn't make it too well because I, <laughs> I didn't come with it. It got all boogered up through the mail. But they fixed it the best they could. But Do you still have that? Mm-hmm. Yeah. What did you, did you buy any, um, anything that was native to Panama? Yes. Yeah, I, I, that uh, silver set I did, and I bought a uh, uh, a ring, and I also bought a uh, a set of earrings. And at the time, that the girl I was going with back here, you know, uh, she has those. I hope she still has them. <laughs> they were really pretty. They were all sterling silver, so they were nice. Very pretty stuff. And they had uh, emeralds down there, too. And they, they'd sell them everything all right on the street, a lot of it, you know, people. But the silver mines were well guarded. They were, in, they were, that's where I got the silver. Boy, that's beautiful. <laughs> Go in that silver mines and look at all that silver that they got. Whew. And you said you had a car. What kind of car did you have down there? <laughs> yeah, it was uh, Austin Healy. <laughs> it was a little car, but it was a lot of fun. And then I, uh, one of the guys was, you know, he's getting out of the service. He's going back to the States and he's selling it. So I bought it. And that's, I think that's how all the cars are down there that the military has. It's passed on. One guy gets out and sells it to the next guy. And I get out and like I did, I sold it to the next guy. So, so consequently, the military personnel brings their vehicles. Yeah. I, if you have enough rank, yes, you can bring mm -hmm. your own. They pay for that to mm -hmm. come down there. Mm -hmm. And then if they wear it out, they just leave it there and for sell it to somebody. And that's mm -hmm. how I got mine. Yeah. They did do some work to it, but parts were cheap. You know, they still had some military. You go through their post there. And they had a place you could take it over and work on it yourself. And a place to park it and so on. It was handy. Mm -hmm. On the weekends, and just go out and jump in your car and go wherever you want to go. As long as you didn't have to get in any trouble with the, with the, the soldiers, and stay away from them. Were were the um, the facilities such as you said that the the medical for the natives was not very good down there? But what about the medical for the the it was military? Great. It was good. Yeah. Yes, it was. They. They really took good care. If even if you got a cold or something, they you go down there and they would take care of you. I remember I had a, a planter's wart I got, one my two, and it was bad. You know, they they took care of it, you know, and I didn't, I couldn't hardly walk. Well, they give you time off, you put you in bags, you just do take your time, just get over it. But yeah, they were good, and they they kept up on the shots. The dentistry was real good. They had the uh, dental facilities. So in hospital, if you got real bad, they would, I think they could send you to Gorgas Hospital, which was in Panama, which was a good hospital. I mean, there was American people there running that too. So, How was the camaraderie with your, um, with your division? It was, it was good. It was good. The, sometimes you hear that officers and the enlisted men cannot fraternize well they they had that down there too but i don't think it was as bad probably in panama i mean they had their certain facilities uh officers facilities and ncos you know non-commissioned officers facilities but when i was driving for the colonel and, or the major there was times that uh they'd ask me for what reason to come over to the officers and, you know I'd go over to the officer whether it was for just a uh, maybe carry a flag or, or whatever you know and they were real nice officers but I never had any trouble with the officers I you know. do you recall the day your service ended <sighs> Well, it was when I finally got, what is it, six years since from the day I went in till you got your final papers that you were done. How come so long? I think you got to stay over six years. I think, aren't you, aren't you on a six year or is that four year? I forget. But you are, 
Uh, I'm not sure how that works. You don't just, like, even if you were drafted for the two years, you still got, I think you got four more years of, in which <clears throat> when I came, when I first got out of Panama, I thought my time was over. But I wasn't home for two weeks, and I got called up to uh, go to uh, Wisconsin for more training. So I had to, and I'd gotten rid of all my uniforms. So they had to furnish me new uniforms again because I thought I was done. But you're not. So, but two years in a row, I got called to go to two weeks training. So they. So when you got out of the active duty service, you were like in the reserves. Re yeah, in active reserves. In, yeah. in active reserves. And they actually called you and up. They called you back up, yep. Wow. You were assigned to a reserve unit, and I got called twice. So I served another four weeks, after, well, two weeks at a time, two different years, two years in a row. But then after that, no more. And I finally got my letter in the paper, or letter in the mail, and I completed my duty so when you actually left Panama did you come straight home or did you have to go to a military base no when I got out of Panama I had to go to uh, Charleston South Carolina to, to clear to get all the paperwork done I mean it was a lot of it was done in Panama but I had to go into Charleston, uh, and that's where you were on your own after that. They they cleared you. You found your own way home then. Did anybody come from Panama to Charleston with you? Oh, yeah. Any other guys? Yeah. Yeah, there was quite a few getting out mm -hmm. at that same time. None in my company, but different companies. Mm -hmm. And we're everybody was you know oh let's get out of here let's get out of here. let's go home you know everybody it was just a chaos because you just want to get through it and get out of there and you time was up and I want to go back home and I want I wanted to see my girlfriend and of course that didn't work either I <laughs> now how did you get home from from Charleston no I met another guy that was from Illinois and he said his uh, folks were going to meet him in Texas and he said if we could get to Texas his folks would bring us or drive us back from Texas to Illinois so we found and it was hard finding a, a flight out of there because everybody was trying to get flights out but we did find a flight and go to Texas and we got into Texas and they picked us up in Texas and we took us to Illinois dropped me off at home and they went on somewhere else and I don't remember who it was either <laughs> I knew it just we all wanted to get home did you um, stay in contact with anybody? Did I what? Did you stay in contact with anybody? No, I didn't, and I should have, but I didn't. I, like I said, I lost probably one of my best friends. Uh, damn it. Did you join any veterans organizations? Uh, the American Legion. American Legion. Are you still a member? Yes. Yeah. Did you um, have any kind of um, post assignment or anything in the American Legion? Uh, yeah, I was uh, I was probably commander for five or six years. Now I, I think, uh, of course, you give that up and let somebody else do it. You know, it's, so I think. Uh, Kevin Yugler is our commander now. So, so you you had you felt that by going into the service, you said that it taught you how to um, be on your own. Yeah, it made you grow up. Grow up, exactly. Um. Did you do you have any other feelings towards the service? No, I don't have any bad feelings towards the service at all. Uh, I, the only thing I hate is uh, somebody's got to die. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
it's not. <clears throat> and you know, when you're in the service, and the time that I was there, and it's a short time of your life, but you, uh, but when you're living with somebody, it's like your own family, but here you're, like I said, you're in this little cupola, and there's four of us in there, and you're together for, well, at the minimum, it's 18 months, a year and a half, and you're living with him, you're showering with him, you're sleeping with him, you're out and working with him, you become pretty close friends, you know. And when that uh, guy decides that he wants to do something different for his country and he volunteers from now on and don't come back, so I'm kind of miss him. And he didn't have to. Do you feel that? Movies that are made about Vietnam, do you feel that they are showing the true picture? Sometimes yes, and sometimes no, no. I think, uh, I think you really, and they maybe they try to make you feel like you're there, but it's just like, uh, you got to be there to witness what's going on. You can sit here and somebody could tell you, but you don't know. You don't know. Even in, even in Panama, with the when we had a they had a Panamanian uprising while we were down there, and uh, of course nobody got hurt. It was just we had enough people down there to control it. So, but you just got to be there to know what's going on. It's not easy. And these, and like you said, uh, the kids that are over there, the ones that are keeping us here, so we can walk around here and tomorrow we can talk to you. But it's too bad that they're so young and have to die. Mm -hmm not have a life. <laughs> do, you, but, go ahead. do you um, have any children? Yes, two. Boys or girls? I have one boy and one girl. Have either one of them joined the service? No. No. No, I did. They, I kind of wished my son would have, but he didn't. So. He probably had enough troubles the way he was <laughs> growing up. But, oh, well. But if someone came to you today and said, I'm thinking of joining the service, you would say it's a good idea. Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. Yes, I would. Even to anybody. You really, it is an opportunity. People say, no, don't go in there, man. You're going to get killed. <laughs> I tell you what, sometimes I think you're safer in there because you know what's going on than you are out here because you get shot or right here on the streets in the military you got rules and regulations that it don't happen so I mean you just I know those that went through combat I know it's it's really rough on them and like my brother Fred he, he was over there for two tours and he don't like to talk about it, but, but I've, he don't have any use for the people that he was over there fighting with. That's just the way it was, you know. But, um, Is there anything you'd like to add? No. I don't think I need to add anything. I just think that... Uh, I just pray that uh, I just pray that the Lord 
understands that those that gave their life did it because they believed. <laughs> and it was their duty. So that I can sit here and talk about it. And that's what I believe. The Lord will take care of them. That place in hell. That's it. Frankie, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for the time that you've given me today. I want to thank you for the time that you've served our, company, our country. And for what you did for us. I didn't and do much. <laughs> you, you've done a lot. And for your fellow soldiers. I thank you. I do too. I thank them. <laughs>